Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Indie Geek and welcome to a live stream. Uh, and I am really excited by this live stream because I've got a fantastic guest on today. Um, uh, I've been a, a fan of, of his work for quite some time. Uh, first of all, uh, with podcast, and then he's more recently been moving over to uh, to YouTube. Uh, and uh, this is part of what I'm trying to do here is to bring in people who've got different thinking, different ways of viewing uh, A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones uh, that will help us see things from slightly different angles. Uh, so I'm really, uh, really pleased and excited to get one of the best thinkers uh, in the community here uh, who can uh, who can join us for an hour or so. Uh, so uh, I'll let him introduce himself, but uh, LML. Hey, guys. Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me on. And I'd like to say hi to everybody that watches your channel. I Return the favor. I'm a big fan of yours and particularly your style of analysis. I'm looking forward to this uh, because I think it'll be an interesting sort of combination. I, uh, <clears throat> When I was talking up this appearance online, I compared you to Aziz from History of Westeros because I think both you guys do a good job of, you know, you're naturally logical and very rational minded as far as how you approach the story. But neither one of you take it so far that you sort of forget it's a fantasy novel and sort of discount the magic and discount the prophecy and try to make everything, you know, mundane. You know, that's that kind of sucks all the fun out of the story. And I hate that. But you and Aziz do a great job of doing that uh, sort of, you know, real rational problem solving analysis. And in particular, I like I like your uh, the train of thought you applied to the Crips and the Horn of Winter, which we're going to talk about in the second half of the show. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan. And just to tell everyone, uh, I go by LML, that's short for Lucifer means Lightbringer. And the word Lucifer does mean Lightbringer. It's a Latin word and it has to do with Venus and the Morning Star. And basically it's all about mythology and we'll talk about a little bit of that today. But you can find all of my stuff at lucifermeanslightbringer.com, podcast, YouTube, Patreon, whatever, whatever, it's all there. Fantastic. Um, okay, guys, so uh, the way that we're going to do this is that um, uh, obviously we'll keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so if you've got any uh, any burning questions, put them in there. We will, of course, st uh, stop and come to uh, any super chats if there's any of them uh, straight away. Uh, but uh, what I was wanting to do for the first half, the first half an hour or so. Robert, actually, you know, if I could just stop you, let me say that I think we have a lot of uh, fans in common here. I'm seeing a lot of names in the chat that I recognize. Sandrixian, Jojo Lady Dane, Melanie Patrick, Emilio's there, all sorts of folks. So, hey, everybody. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. You're right. They're, they're, um, the glasses are going on. I'm going to have a look now. Uh, Melanie Patrick, uh, Merit Jags, Sonia. Hi, great to see you. I saw who who was there. True to you. Uh, Ty Cat, I know you've been trying to come uh, join for the live stream for a while. Living my right. Chrissy of Old Stones. Recognize her, of course. Excellent. Lost for words I saw earlier. Lovely to see you. Um, uh, okay, guys. Uh, it's... Uh, do just give us uh, give us some uh, some uh, thoughts over there in the chat, but I just want to kick us off um, uh, by uh, if it's okay, LML, if you could just like set out uh, your overall thinking. Your 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 podcast is is um, uh, the the mythic astronomy of ice and fire, and and it looks an awful lot at uh, the kind of the I use the word foreshadowing a lot uh, when looking at the sort of the literary uh, uh, devices that George R. R. Martin uses. Uh, something happens to one character, foreshadows what might happen to another character. Uh, you've taken that, I think, another step deeper in looking at sort of the, the mythical uh, and, as we'll come on to, the astronomical uh, kind of foreshadowing. Do you want to just sort of like set out briefly what, what your thinking is on this at a sort of a high level? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to lead into it, too. So everybody's noticed that there is a lot of parallels in A Song of Ice and Fire. There's parallels between Bran and Daenerys. There's parallels between, um, you know, Arya and Sansa both have echoes of Lyanna in their plot. There's all kinds of parallels throughout the story. Mance uh, parallels Rhaegar in a lot of ways, and both of those guys parallel Bale the Bard. And that's led some people to think that Mance is Rhaegar, which I don't think he is but there's no doubt that they have a similar set of symbolism. And so <clears throat> essentially the way I think of A Song of Ice and Fire, Robert, is as a fractal story. It's more than just the characters sort of paralleling each other. What Martin's really doing is paralleling the past and the future and the present. And so we find these little drama plays 
and these sort of archetypal roles that tend to repeat throughout history. And some of the most important parallels are between the very most ancient legends and the main characters with their like their most important scenes. And so my long night theory starts with one of those parallels, which is the parallel between uh, the myth that Danny hears about there once being a second moon in the sky that wandered too close to the sun and cracked from the heat and a thousand thousand dragons poured forth and drank the fire of the sun. And that's why dragons breathe flame. That's pretty much word for word the myth. And it comes in a game of thrones in Danny's like third or fourth chapter. So it's very, very early on. But then at the end of the books, Danny essentially acts out this myth when she wakes the dragons. And of course, the myth itself is about dragons, you know, waking from the moon, which is kind of a weird concept at first. And then so when she actually wakes dragons, she parallels the myth. So here's how this works. All right. So Danny and Drogo, they have pet names for each other, right? What are their pet names for each other? Oh, you're, you're asking me? I'm asking you, yeah. <laughs> it's that my sun and my moon. Uh, there's, there's... Right. So my son, my son and stars, and then uh, Drogo calls Danny moon of my life. And they say it over and over and over and over. So what this does is it establishes Drogo as what you'd call a solar king. He represents the sun. And Danny is a lunar queen. She's the moon queen. She's a silver queen. And so what happens is the myth about dragons talks about the moon wandering too close to the sun, which is essentially just a good way of describing an eclipse. That's what an eclipse is, is the moon appearing to wander into the sun. And so when Drogo, when his dead body is lit on fire, you get this big bonfire, his funeral pyre. Since Drogo's the sun, that pyre is the fire of the sun. And then what does Danny, the moon queen, what does she do? She wanders too close to it. She wanders right into the pyre and that's when the dragon eggs hatch. And so it's actually a recreation of the myth that we heard. <clears throat> so then the last piece is trying to figure out what this myth actually means. Like, what does it mean for dragons to wake from the moon? That sounds like basically nonsense. Well, the thing is meteors and comets have always been described as dragons or flying serpents in history. And so when you think of a moon cracking somehow, you know, some sort of collision event or astronomical disaster or, you know, some sort of celestial disaster, I should say, then the, the dragons that would wake from the moon would be meteors. You'd get some sort of meteorites falling to Earth and very conveniently, meteorites happen to be just the sort of thing which can cloud the sky with ash and debris so as to block out the sun for several years at a time. Okay, and so, so let's 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 get onto that bit in just one moment, if that's okay. Because I just want to sort of like focus in firstly on on this this initial uh, uh, idea that George R. R. Martin uses a number of levels uh, of of uh, I, I'm using the word foreshadowing. It's uh, there may well be a better one of, of of sort of hinting at what is to come by looking at other events, uh, and that's not just in the characters, but also in the myths that he creates. You talked about Lightbringer and Azora High, and that that's certainly one kind of myth of the past that is being recreated in a way in the present, uh, and also uh, what we're going to come on to is the more sort of uh, the, the idea that uh, a lot of these myths are actually memories that are sort of filtered down to become legends. They're memories of actual things that happened, but they become legends, they become stories, and that's how yeah. they become remembered. Um, and, and just uh, can I pick you up and I'll perhaps pick your brains on the the, the intentionality of language. Uh, for me, George R. R. Martin, particularly in book one, uh, when he thought it was a trilogy, mm -hmm. he uses a lot of very intentional language uh, uh, when he's talking about dragons and light and life. Uh, could you just like draw out a little bit more about the language that he uses in that scene at the end with Danny going into the funeral pyre because i think i'm watching your sort of introductory video there's a that you drew out quite a lot there what's what's the sort of the, the language that he uses that sort of to show what lines he's drawing between the myths and what's okay happening so in reality? A, a good example of that would be the symbol of the egg okay so if danny's the moon then technically to recreate the myth exactly she should walk into the fire and then her body should explode and turn into dragons but that wouldn't make sense, obviously. So what happens is the dragon's eggs that she places in the pyre around Drogo's body, they serve as a parallel symbol of the moon. 
And if you remember back to that uh, that myth, I sort of skipped the beginning of it, but what it, it starts with one of her handmaidens saying, the moon was an egg, Khaleesi. And she goes, what? And she's like, yes, that's right. The moon was an egg. And one day it wandered too close to the sun and it cracked and the, egg, and the dragons hatched from the moon egg. And so by drawing this, by calling the moon an egg, you can then see the dragon's eggs as moons. And so when Danny puts the, the, uh, the dragon's eggs in the pyre, that's also like the moon wandering too close to the sun. And when they crack open, that's like the moon cracking open. And so um, let's see, I, I actually didn't have the, uh, my actual episode pulled up, but I will pull it up real quick and then I'll have the, uh, the exact quotes on there. But there's a lot of great language about like um, one of the cracks of the eggs was as loud as the, uh, the breaking of the world, for example. And the breaking of the world is exactly how I would describe the meteor impact on the earth that caused the long night. Uh, I also think, by the way, the breaking of the arm of Dorn is an event that happened uh, because of a moon meteor impact at the time of the long night and not thousands of years earlier, as we are told. So is that is that kind of what you're talking about as far as the symbolic language? It, it, exactly, and I think that uh, so and that for me and I just well I, well I spot there over in the in the in the chat we've had a super chat from Jags two thousand for a dollar. Thank you so much. That's really kind. Uh, the um, uh, that that scene for me is is absolutely critical to our understanding of what's going on. Uh, I think across the not just ha what happened in the past, but what's going on into the future. That scene with Danny, and I think that it tells us huge amount of how magic operates in the world of ice and fire. Um, uh, you can almost it's actually it's well worth uh, going back there and having a look. I think at how Miri Mazdur reacts who clearly understands magic and then there comes a moment when you see that she realizes that danny has actually learned from her how magic works and that's the moment she gets scared because that's the moment she realizes what's about to happen so so that's that's the that's the terrible knowledge the fire of the gods that is being attained in that moment and that's a whole different theme that i talk about a lot uh, but just since you mentioned miriam as door uh, she plays a good role in that. So she plays a kind of Nissa Nissa role uh, in that she dies to birth the dragons, which are analogous to Lightbringer. And sure enough, her she gives a wail of agony and ecstasy in the middle of that ceremony, which of course is the language when Nissa Nissa was stabbed with Lightbringer. She let out a cry of agony and ecstasy, which actually left a, cr a, a crack across the face of the moon. And that's the other part of the, the story that I was getting to is that, of course, when Danny's hatching those dragons, she's also fulfilling the prophecy of Azor Ahai being reborn under a bleeding star to wake dragons from stone, right? I mean, it's, it's all right there. You have the bleeding star, the, the dragons waking from stone. So she's fulfilling a prophecy and recreating a myth at the same time. And that myth about the moon cracking is mirrored in the Azor Ahai prophecy or the original story because when Nissa Nissa was stabbed, her cry left a crack across the face of the moon. So basically, if you look at this Carthian tale of the second moon cracking and the Azor High myth, you have two stories now that talk about the moon cracking somehow. And that's what helps us to believe that this part of the myth, at least, has some sort of origin in reality because we've got different people talking about cracking moons. So obviously there was some sort of catastrophe in the sky that became mythicized, which is, it absolutely would. Uh, absolutely, and, and 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 I'm going to get onto that in just one second because I think the other thing I just want to draw out there in terms of the magic and the symbolism is this idea that comes out in that scene again about uh, the sacrifice being needed and and uh, and death paying for life, uh, and we see that there were three deaths in and around that. Uh, that funeral pie, you've got uh, uh, Rago, Danny's, uh, Danny's uh, unborn son. Um, uh, you've got Carl Drogo, of course, who who, who died, and you also you've got Miri Mazdur, who died in the funeral pyre itself. Those three deaths bringing uh, life to the dragons, and that symbolically is also happening back in the um, uh, the story of uh, Azora High and Lightbringer. The sacrifice had to be made of her uh, exactly. in order to be bringing forth Lightbringer. Um, we've had a couple of uh, of uh, uh, 
uh, super chats, one of which that I hope that you understand because I'm not sure that I do. Um, yeah, I was uh, going to ask you if you knew what they're talking about. Uh, they're asking well, for the horns. They're ask asking for the horns. So uh, um, I... Uh, <laughs> hang on. Just hang on a second. It's uh, uh, Jags two thousand five dollars. Thank you very much, LML. Love you guys, but uh, uh, and stuff. But put on the horns, the antlers. Uh, so I think I think he's just headed off to do that. So uh, uh, so there, you've got your wish. Uh, and then also we've had uh, uh, San Rixi and ten dollars. Just saying, you're doing wonderful, guys. Thank you so much. That was really kind. Thank you. Um, so uh, so while LML has gone off to try and find his antlers, uh, which uh, I am very much looking forward to seeing. Um, I just unpicking that uh, that scene again. I would highly recommend that if you get the chance, go back there and actually have a look at at how much Danny was suddenly starting to understand what <laughs> what she was doing. Uh, I'm laughing because I can suddenly see the antlers. Uh, uh, she suddenly gained an understanding of what was needed for her when she saw the comet, uh, and then when she understood what Miri Mazdo was saying to her. Uh, but uh, LML, just talk for a moment in your antlers. <laughs> well, the full costume involves a white beard and white hair, so it's like a king of winter Stagman costume. It has to do with European folklore. I've gone pretty deep on uh, the Green Man, Sir Nunos, uh, you know, mythology in a, in a series called Sacred Order of Green Zombies, because it has a lot to do with the Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, it's all it's all mythology based on the turning of the seasons. And of course, the big problem is the song in the Song of Ice and Fire is that occasionally the seasons stop turning and you get stuck on winter. So it's basically like the disrupted nature cycle is is a big part of the story and. Yeah, ever since I wore the horns, they've uh, they've been popular. What can I say? <laughs> well, well, they look really good on you. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, keep them on as long as you want. Uh, Treat yeah, to you. Not? Thank you very much. Uh, Ten dollars. Uh, it's so wonderful see to see the two of you in this conversation. I love each of your channels and listen for hours. Thank you. That's a really kind thing to say. Um, okay, shall we get on to uh, what I think is is. is for me, it's the sort of the central part of of, uh, of understanding your theory and where you're coming from. You've you've started talking about it a couple of times, and I've kind of stopped you. But um, uh, why don't you talk now about the the long night? What what caused, in your view, the long night? So the long night, <clears throat> the long night needs the sun to stop shining, and there's only a couple ways to accomplish that. All right, there's basically what you need to do is you need to fill the atmosphere with shit, with clouds and ash, debris and smoke. And there's three ways that can happen. A nuclear fallout, which is called a nuclear winter, or a volcanic winter, which is when you have a super massive volcano explode and throw so much debris in the air that it blocks the sun. And the third way that you can get that kind of a prolonged winter is of course a meteor or comet impact. And since we, uh, you know, I don't buy the whole, you know, a song of ice and fire is secret science fiction theories. So that rules out the nuclear disaster. And we've just had a huge volcanic explosion with the doom. I mean, it couldn't be any bigger than that, but that was only 400 years ago and it didn't cause a long night. So that leaves meteors. And the thing is we have a ton of meteor clues in all of the mythology all around the story. It's not just the dragons waking from the moon and the Carthine tale and the moon cracking in the Lightbringer story, there's falling stars all over the place. You look at House Dane, of course, they have a falling star in their mythology and their sword Dawn could be the dragon steel of the last hero based on the idea that a meteor sword could be a dragon sword because meteors can be seen as dragons. That's an old idea that's been around in the fandom. Then you have uh, Huger of the Hill, the father pulled down seven stars for his crown so again, we have falling star mythology. There's the story of Galadon of Morn, who was given a magic sword called the Just Maid by quote, the maiden herself, which could just be a way of talking about the moon maiden, giving a magic sword via a meteor. Then you've got the hammer of the waters, which is this mysterious thing. A hammer implies something falling and smashing, but we don't, we're not given what that is. It's just this mysterious thing. And maybe it was an earthquake, or something, but there was some sort of impact disaster and a bunch of land sunk. And then wouldn't you know it, the some of the remaining land of the Arm of Dorne is the Stepstone Islands. One of those Stepstone Islands is named Bloodstone. And of course the guy who's remembered as causing the long night in the East is the Bloodstone Emperor. 
And then you've got sun spear, but a sun spear is just a symbolic way of describing a, me a fiery meteor coming from the sun that drank the fire of the sun. So basically, as you go through the symbolic language of the story and the ancient myths, you're gonna find meteors and falling stars all over the damn place. And from a general sort of just broad point of view, I what you what Martin is doing is he's giving us hints like, hey, there was some sort of falling star event in the past. And conveniently, like I said, that explains the long night pretty well. Absolutely. So. I mean, I, I, I have to say, I mean, I've said it said it to you in private and I'm very happy to say it here. I, I mean, I love this theory. I, I For me, it, it works better than any other uh, sort of theory or ideas or explanation that I've come across about what actually caused uh, the long night. And it ties in, I think, particularly well with the, the idea that comes throughout the books that uh, celestial things have magical power or they bring magic there's i mean it's most notably again we're again coming back to the uh uh to the danny at the funeral pyre moment but it's it's most notable that it's when the red comet goes across uh that right. that's when uh not only do the dragons come in but then suddenly there's this huge upsurge of magic and it's almost as if uh, uh yes the dragons can bring magic but that in order for the dragons to come, there had to be this kind of confluence of things. And it's almost as if the comet gave a kind of a kickstart to that in some kind of magical way. And then looking across the piece, we, we have uh, a couple of people mentioning it over in the uh, in the chat, the uh, uh, um, House Dane uh, uh, Sword Dawn uh, made from a comet, which given how old it is and given how legendary it is, it's, it is magical in some way. And uh, when you dig into this, the, the, the world, you find a huge amount of these kind of uh, oily black kind of stones around the place that perhaps they also are kind of celestial. They're very special in some way. Um, well, so the Bloodstone Emperor, who's remembered as causing the Long Night, he worshipped a black stone, which is a very sort of Lovecraftian you know, insertion into the story. But the point is, the guy that caused the long night worshipped a black meteor. So that just tells you like, and, I mean, I guess it could have been an old meteor, but it gives you a clue about meteors falling around the time of the long night. And look at a shy. I mean, if meteors are magic, and and I would say poisonous in this case, look, I mean, just look at a shy. There's, there's this big shadow hanging over the whole land. It's all blighted and ruined. But the thing about Ashai is that it's the biggest city in the world. It's big enough to hold Volantis and Karth and Old Town all together. And so the only way that a large city gets built thousands of years ago is if there was some great, rich and powerful, wealthy civilization that had the resources and the population to build a huge city. But you couldn't do that in Ashai the way it is now. And Ashai looks like something really bad happened to it. So all of that leads you, again, using your sort of logical means of analysis, it just tells you that a shy at one time was a really nice place to live. And that's when they would have built this huge city. And then something happened. And I would say that that's that black stone falling probably like right in the heart of the Shadowlands or somewhere. And that toxicity from the meteor. And again, this is a Lovecraft element. Meteors that bleed toxic ooze into the, into the land and turn all the land gray and dead. That's right out of Lovecraft. So that's what I think happened out of shy. Um, so yeah, uh, but, but to go back to what you were saying about Dawn and what some people were mentioning about Dawn, the important thing to understand is Venus mythology. And that's why I chose the name Lucifer means Lightbringer. So Venus is a planet obviously, but it appears as a star in the sky and it actually is the brightest star in the sky. And it has this totally unique behavior. It has, to, I'm not going to explain all the mechanics of it, but it has to do with the fact that Venus is closer to the sun than we are. So it can never appear very far away from the sun in the sky. And so what Venus does, it's totally unique and it's inspired myths all throughout history because it's so unique. What it does is it switches positions from the morning star to the even star every 200 and some days. And when it's in the morning star position, it rises from the horizon just before the sun does. It rises about just a little bit above the horizon and then the sun comes out and Venus disappears. And so it looks like a star that's risen from the ground and ascended to heaven. But when it's in the even star position, it comes out the first star of evening when it's just starting to get dark. You see Venus just above the horizon, maybe like a third of the way up. And then as the, as the night goes on, it falls to the horizon and disappears in a couple of hours. 
So it does this routine where it's either rising up to heaven and disappearing or appearing from heaven and falling to the earth. And so all of the mythology that's based on Venus has to do with gods ascending from heaven or falling from heaven. So Lucifer is an angel that's kicked out of heaven. That's just the even star falling from heaven and then into the earth. And Jesus is also called the morning star because what does he do? He comes down from heaven to earth, hangs out for 33 years, and then he ascends back to heaven. Same thing with Quetzalcoatl. He goes down to the underworld for a certain amount of time that corresponds with Venus's cycles. And then he's resurrected and comes back up when Venus turns back into the morning star. It's all over the world because Venus is such a unique thing. And so the point is, House Dane, Lightbringer, the Night's Watch being the sword, the light that brings the dawn and the sword in the darkness, all of those ideas are cut from Venus mythology. So it tells you that all those things are connected, essentially. Fantastic. And 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 I know we're just looking at the, the comments in the chat. I can see people are loving this as much as I am. This is uh, uh, this, this this is uh, exactly what I was hoping we would get. It's just a completely different uh, perspective from the sort of the more uh, literary and internal coherence uh, approaches that a lot of YouTubers like me quite often and go into. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, super chats over, uh, over there. Kay Jackson uh, and Emilio Camacho Ariche. Thank you both very much. Uh, Thanks, guys. I Thank know you. well. That's amazing. Um, so, uh, can I just pick up having, if, if we accept this idea of the uh, the long night being caused by um, uh, let, let celestial events, let's call them. Uh, and uh, so presumably then the end of the long night, let's try and think through these implications, the end <laughs> of the long night, presumably therefore was actually not caused by killing off a big baddie, but by the end of the, the natural phenomena. Would, is that how you follow that train of logic? Well, so this is, I, I love how you went right to like the hardest question basically that you could ask about this theory. Just, just try end? my best. So, well, if so, if the sky is filled with ash and debris, I mean, what do you need to end it? You need wind, right? So I guess it's the winds of winter that blow away the smoke. Maybe. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. We've speculated about that because the, there's a lot of ties between green seers and wind. Uh, but, uh, but no, to be honest, what's happening is that uh, even though what I'm saying is like the meteors caused the long night and the moon disaster and all that, all that stuff is paralleled on the ground. Like Azor High stabbing Nissa Nissa is the sun stabbing the moon. Just take my word for it. I explained the detail of that. But so the point is like everything that's in the sky is just a parallel for what's happening on the ground. And as Martin says, the most important thing of any story is the characters and their hearts in conflict. So all this stuff is only like a complement to the, the, the drama on the ground. So there's parallel events on the ground. You could say that Azor Ahai's killing Nissa Nissa was the cause of the long night. Or you could say that mankind forcing their way into the Weirwood net, which is another symbolic parallel because the Weirwoods parallel the moon and the green seer is like the fire going into the moon. And that is also this great abominable act. So the point is it's, it's really hard to pin down what was the actual cause? Because what Martin's doing is he's just creating this milieu of parallel ideas that both are in the sky and on the ground. So actually, I do think the end of the long night, it has to do with humans doing stuff and the conflicted hearts of people, but it will parallel the events in the sky. I mean, uh, that that makes an awful lot of sense to me. I, I just uh, we, another another super chat. Uh, Lana Allen says, "Robert, you're my fave. Thank you so much. Uh, that's really kind." Um, uh, can I take this from a slightly because I where where I'm fascinated with this idea uh, is is what the implications are for the story. Um, now uh, we I think uh, we as in the sort of the community uh, uh, quite often just automatically assume that uh, the others, the White Walkers, brought the Long Night with them. And so what's happening now is that they are again bringing uh, winter with them. Now, uh, if we are to accept the fact that the Long Night the first time around came from a specific uh, astronomical event, by all these comments, fall uh, comments falling, then first of all, we have to say- Yeah, it's, it's gonna happen again, yes. It, so your 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 view is that it, there will again be another uh, uh, yes excellent and when so when do you think that's going to happen is that just a, a book thing I would or? say probably well so the whole idea is that 
if there's going to be another meteor event of any kind, it would be used as a mechanism to trigger the new long night. We all expect a new long night to fall. But the thing is, the TV show glossed over that. They just had the others break down the wall and invade. But the others can't invade in book canon until the sudden is actually hidden because they're like vampires. They only come out at night. And so that was what we're told the original, the long night was when the sudden was hidden for years. And this would allow the others to hunt you and fight you 24 seven. There's no respite, nowhere to hide. That was the long night. So in order for that to happen, we need to hide the sun again. And you know, logic dictates if it was a meteor impact that hid the sun before, then we're gonna need another meteor impact to hide the sun. So it's gonna be spectacular and definitely like one of the most high fantasy things that's ever happened if it happens. However, it's really just gonna be a trigger for something we already expect, which is a new long night. Um, I, I'm just gonna push on this one a little bit because I think that that's for something sure. I, have to, ha I have to admit, I've not really imagined happening uh, in, in the next couple of books. Um, I was, uh, I've got it here, immediately before doing this, I was rereading the, the, the prologue of, of, of Game of Thrones. Uh, and uh, it struck me again how whenever um, the, the three Night's Watchmen were um, uh, anywhere near the others, they talk about the wind, they talk about cold. And so uh, it's, it's very clear that there is a localized effect at least of when the others yes. are there, they do bring uh, some sort of change in local weather, whether that's just the wind or the air temperature or something. Uh, so for me, the question is, is this a matter of numbers? Is it that if they get enough of them and they come together, they can bring that with them? And if they can in some way bring the wind, they can also perhaps control the, the clouds and things like that, and maybe they can bring a long night with them. How does that's that pretty idea? much th no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, if it, if I were like pretending I had never thought of my theory, that that would make a lot of sense. I mean, you can, and I think that's what the show has done is essentially they're like, well, when the others come around, you get those clouds and it just kind of gets dark. But in the books, it's really clear like when Cold Hands and them are racing to the caves, he's specifically saying, look, as soon as that sun goes down, we're fucked, so we got to hurry. I mean, it's it's a it's a mechanical thing. Like the others do not come out during the day. So, and we're told specifically in the in the past that the sun was hidden for years, and we even know that it happened in Essos and on the Roin and in Yt. They all talk about a long night, and so they don't talk about the others. You know, there's no others on the Roin that we hear of. There are the demons of the Lion of Night in the in the Far East, which could be others. Who knows? Uh, but the point is, there's a lot of memories of the long night that don't have anything to do with others. So it really does seem like a global phenomenon, I would say, not a localized thing. Absolutely. And I think that that is the, uh, the, the nub of the issue, which is that the long night, the first long night was clearly a global event. Um, and therefore, whatever precipitated it had to have been a global event of some kind and that i think is for me is the thing that is uh that that is most attractive about the theory of the of the the comets in a very just purely logical sense is that it had to be something big it wasn't just something that came out of the north of one continent that's right. um the the question that i'm so, left so, with so basically it makes it means the others were taking advantage of the darkness essentially Exactly. And so so for me, the question I'm left with was, were th if they were taking advantage of the darkness, is this just what's happening again now? Are they taking advantage of what they think will be the darkness again because they are on the move? Or was what was happening with Craster and elsewhere, was this a case of them trying to build up this critical mass to create some sort of darkness? Yes, yeah, so I do, me, is I do the, think the, that's part of it. Yeah. Craster uh, giving his sons, they're definitely charging up their army. And I think that Craster parallels Knight's King because it was said that Knight's King was found to be sacrificing to the others. And we know that sacrificing to the others actually means giving your sons to the others to be turned into others. But here's the twist, and this is what I've been writing about lately, is that I don't think Knight's King lived after the long night as most people think. I think he's actually Azor High and he lived during the long night. And what happened, what you've got essentially is Azor High, or maybe his son, for example, uh, had something to do with creating the others. 
Um, and so there's 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 a tie. Let me sort of back up a little bit. We've got this whole set of mythology from the East about Azor Ahai and Lightbringer and dragons. And Danny's all about dragons and Lightbringer and shit. Then you have all this Northern mythology about the Long Night and the others and Night's King and Last Hero and stuff that doesn't have really anything to do with Azor Ahai except for that there's that dragon steel sword that kind of sounds like it could be Lightbringer, right? And so what, you, what you've got is this big question of, well, what does all this Azor Ahai shit have to do with the Starks and the others, which are clearly like the center of the story, right? The Starks, their conflict with the others, that's the meat of it. So the, there's this big question of well, how are the dragons gonna be involved in that? I've got a, an elaborate, not an elaborate theory, but there's a set of theories that shows you how Azor Ahai came to Westeros and eventually meets up with the last hero story and how it all sort of comes together and has something to do with each other. And that's why we have so many dragon people coming to the wall. You got Maester Aemon up there. We got John, of course. We've got Stannis with his Lightbringer copy heading up there. Danny's going to be up at the wall by the end of the story. So this whole idea of like dragon people coming to the wall to face the others, that's a thing. It it, right? it, it is a thing. I mean, and and this is where for me the uh, the overall f literary theme that George R. R. Martin is coming from which is the title of the whole series, A Song of Ice and Fire. It is about these two uh, different forces. Now, they're not necessarily opposing forces. He, he takes inspiration from Robert Frost's poem, Fire and Ice, when it, it, it's basically saying, and I wish I could quote it all off the top of my head, but he's saying either of these forces could destroy the world. Look at ice. Look at the, the, the others, the White Walkers, they could destroy the world. Look at fire, the dragons, they could be firebombing cities, killing everybody. Both of these forces could do it. And I think the... the... Okay, I got, I got it for you. It's, it's, we got to read it. It's so good. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. Oh, God, they're giving me a friggin' an ad for Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> some say the world will end in fire some say in ice but from from what i've tasted of desire i hold with those who favor fire but if i had to perish twice i think i know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice exactly and i think that the um uh the the feel there is very much either of those forces could destroy the world and i think that the the message from George R. R. Martin, who is is quite a, a pacifistic person, is humanity stuck in the middle. Humanity's getting hit from both of these things. How do we actually sort of negotiate and navigate our way through this to try and prevent either of these forces from doing what they could do to us? Um, just very quickly, uh, um, I had a, a super chat from Lost for Words, uh, 19 pounds and 99 pence. Thank you so much. That's amazing. The, uh, that's Lost for Words is, is, uh, is amazing. So thank you. And it's in, it's in real money as well. I, I love it when I can tell what, uh, how much, uh, uh, things are. Uh, thank you. That's incredibly generous. Um, the real money, <laughs> real money. Uh, so like none of this do cool. dollar rubbish. This is, this is real money. Um, can we, let's just take a quick break of that. So, uh, okay. There's a couple of things I just wanted to say to my uh, my Let's patrons and uh, and my subscribers. Um, uh, first up, uh, I'll be I, back in two minutes. Then you go for it. Uh, so first up, uh, I just wanted to. Um, uh, Talk about Westworld. Um, as as a lot of you know, I've been I've been focusing a lot on Westworld. Um, really looking forward to the next season. Um, uh, and I did my first Westworld live stream uh, just a couple of days ago. The idea was to do that one, uh, a shared one with with Justin Thomas, uh, who unfortunately couldn't make it. But we're going to try again next Tuesday. So if you like Westworld, uh, do uh, please tune into that next Tuesday. Uh, secondly, for my patrons, just what I wanted to say. Uh, was first of all, thank you. I honestly, I could not do this without you. Um, uh, I say every time, but I, I, I completely mean it. Um, uh, the uh, for all five dollar patrons, you will probably have seen uh, that I dropped uh, some uh, random extra um uh, audio content just uh i think just yesterday actually so don't forget to go and check that out ten dollar patrons uh now get a chance to vote on what videos i do they decided on two things uh the first of them was 
a character study on Kyburn, um, which I've now completed and it's ready uh, and it will probably go live on, I think, Monday. Um, I hope you like it. I have to admit, I, I now look at Kyburn in a completely different way, uh, having actually studied the character. Um, uh, so I hope you like that. Second, the other one, which is three tinfoil theories uh, that I actually like, um, that will probably come about a week after. Um, as you probably know, I'm not a big fan of tinfoil, tinfoil theories most of the time, but there are some that I do enjoy. Um, at this point, I was just going to uh, hand over to LML to see if there's anything he was wanting to say. Um, uh, looks like he's just gone off for just one moment. Uh, so let's just have a quick look. Just uh, I just want to say hi to a few people in the chat. Um, uh, who we've got? Uh, Talking Thrones. I will be collabing with In Deep Geek soon. It's already in the works. It absolutely is. Talking Thrones. Uh, uh, great to see you. I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, who else have we got there? Kimberly G. Uh, Gray Areas here as well. Hey, we've got all the guys here. Great to see you all. Um, and we're, we've got LML back. Uh, LML, um, uh, you're looking amazing as always, is there anything you would like to be uh, advertising, telling people that you're up to? Snow! Snow! <laughs> <laughs> I actually am writing about uh, the others uh, and their blood connection to the Starks right now. That's called Blood of the Other. That's the new series I'm working on. But I would like to thank all my patrons too. They're, they're the reason I'm able to spend Thursday afternoon hanging out with you. So thanks to them. Fantastic. Um, uh, what you missed was that we've got some uh, we've got some Game of Thrones glitterati in the chat. Uh, oh no, I didn't that. I've been watching. I see Grey Area and uh, Talking Thrones in there. Ab absolutely, big fan of both of them, and uh, uh, hoping to be uh, uh, doing some collaborations with both of them in in the future. Um, There's a pack mule. Uh, absolutely, I've got there. Lots of amazing people. Um, Okay, should we? Should we? Oh, uh, just before, oh, just before I go away from the chat, uh, Karen Richmond, thank you so much. Twenty dollars, uh, so much great information. I'm going to have to watch this at least another three times. Wow. Well, so, um, Karen, I would, I, if I could, I'll go ahead and and put a pump for my channel here. So I, yeah, go for I'm it. summarizing a lot of information in a very short amount of time. The cool thing about uh, George Martin's writing is that he spells out everything through symbolic language. So <clears throat> when you listen to my podcast or read the essay version, which by the way, my podcasts and my blog essays are exactly the same. So you can basically listen or read as you prefer because some people like it one way and the other, but I use a lot of text quotes. So I don't make any theories by just sitting around and going, hmm, well maybe this and maybe that. All I do is read the books and look at this, the double meanings of the symbolic language and I find scenes that match with each other and start to put together the archetypes and the symbolism. So everything that I say, there's like, I mean, I, it doesn't mean it's right, but I'm basing it heavily on analysis of the text. So I would encourage you to go to lucifermeanslightbringer.com if any of that stuff sounded interesting to you and uh, check out either the podcast or the essays and go into detail. Basically all I do, um, Robert, is, is sit around and go, God damn, A Song of Ice and Fire is cool. God damn, George is so smart. Look how clever George is. Like my whole mission and the whole reason I started doing this is because I started picking up on this deeper stuff in the books and it just blows me away how clever and amazing it is. And all I'm trying to do with my podcast is sort of open that up to everybody and invite people into that sort of deeper layer of meaning to the books because it makes the books like more enjoyable to read. You can reread all the books and see all this other stuff going on. And it really, it adds this dimension that wasn't there before. So it's all to the greater glory of George and A Song of Ice and Fire. That's, I'm a, I don't say anything bad about George. And if I catch people dissing George on the internet, man, I hit him with the hammer. I just, I can't stand it. I think he's great. Uh, well, you won't get any disagreement from me. I, he he absolutely is great, and um, uh, I, I just want to sort of echo what I said at the beginning uh, of of this uh, live stream. Uh, I personally am a big fan uh, of what LML does, um, and uh, I what I hope from this live stream is that is that my subscribers, my patrons, uh, having been exposed to just like a little bit of your thinking, a little bit of the way that you. Uh, that you view a song of ice and fire and approach it that, that they they go out and explore that so do um, I've left a link down in the description to uh, I think your YouTube page but I'll also uh, add one on uh, to your uh, to your website as well so uh, please do go if you, uh, if you type in Lucifer and Lightbringer into the internet you'll get my stuff I mean that's really that's all you'll get so it's super easy to find all my stuff Excellent. <laughs> just don't 
Don't click on any of the funny articles, though. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, Crips of Winterfell, ten dollars. Uh, thank you so much, uh, 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 Crips. Uh, That's the question a, right there. Too. He's asking the, the exact right question. He said, "Did a trial run on my bingo game, Heart Lady, and Living My Rhapsody mm -hmm. won this freebie trial run?" Uh, I well done, Heart Lady, and Living My Rhapsody. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's get on to uh, what I said. We'd be oh, we've got to have another one from Scott McCloy. Um, uh, how does symbolism support uh, the Kings uh, of Winter Rising? Oh, yeah, so that's exactly, exactly, exactly that's the question. Exactly where we're going now. Uh, <laughs> it's like so, wait, he's a plant. <laughs> um, uh, so. Uh, I, my subscribers um, uh, and, and, and patrons, I'm sure, will will have seen a video I did a, a week or two ago um, uh, on uh, the Horn of Winter uh, and uh, the Stark Dead in the Winterfell crypts. And, and I set out my thinking that um, uh, the Horn of Winter is the horn that Sam has been lugging around. That's not a particularly original thought. Lots of people have had that before. Um, but I also set up my thinking that this, the purpose of this horn is not uh, to bring down the wall, as the, some, uh, the sort of the, the legend says, uh, but it's to, uh, as it's apparently happened in the, the, the myth, the legend of what happened with the Night's King, uh, the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, uh, that it raised giants from the earth. And my uh, suggestion is that those giants are figurative giants being uh, the historical Starks who were buried in the crypts uh, and uh, so that's why there's there's a part of the um, the crypts which are caved in because the very earliest Starks have already risen uh, uh, from their graves uh, and then the horn was broken uh, by Brandon the breaker uh, as a way to uh, prevent it being used so sort of frivolously didn't want to destroy it because it would be used again at some point probably but he didn't want it to be used just by anyone uh, and so now Sam has that uh, and at some point he and possibly Bran will figure out exactly how this works and the, the horn will get blown and then the dead from Winterfell will rise uh, in a kind of a, an echo of Tolkien and we all know how much uh, George R. R. Martin loves Tolkien uh, the dead men of Dunharrow that Aragorn yeah. goes and brings forward to uh, to fight uh, against Sauron's forces so that's my that was the the general thinking that I put forward in my video um, and then when we were chatting uh, Alan and I, and I uh, before this uh, he uh, he referred me on to uh, a, a video that he'd done uh, I think it was just a, a a while ago uh, that was looking at the foreshadowing of this, uh, which is exactly what we've been talking about and the, the question we had there in the, the Super Chat just a moment ago. Uh, so I thought it'd be quite useful to, if you could draw out a few, just to start with, draw out a few of these moments of foreshadowing that can perhaps underline this thought that the Stark dead will rise from the crypt. So, uh, so could you give us a few examples to start with? Yeah, so what me and uh, Joe Magician did uh, did the live stream on this, and so I've pulled some of the quotes that we gathered from that one, and it's basically the 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 big picture is every single time anybody goes into the crypts, those Stark statues are anthropomorphized, and it happens literally every time. They're watching, they're following, they're you know they're giving Ned the cold, they're giving Robert cold looks, or they're giving Ned foreboding. Uh, but some of the best stuff happens actually when Ned and Robert are in the crypts the very first time. Okay, so let's read this. He led the way between the pillars and Robert followed wordlessly, shivering in the subterranean chill. It was always cold down here. Their footsteps rang off the stones and echoed in the vault overhead as they walked among the dead of House Stark. The Lords of Winterfell watched them pass. Their likenesses were carved into the stones that sealed their tombs. In long rows they sat, blind eyes staring out into eternal darkness, while great stone direwolves curled round their feet. The shifting shadows made the stone figures seem to stir as the living passed by. And then <clears throat> there's a, uh, a parallel scene later when Bran and Osha and Rickon and everybody is hiding in the crypts. It says, when the shadows moved, it looked for an instant as if the dead were rising as well. And so it's it's the exact same sentence. And it's that's a one good example um, because it's 
It's more than like, I think most people remember this, that they watch everybody, but there's, it actually goes further. It, it makes it look like as they're stirring and rising. And then, so going back to Ned and Robert in the, in the tomb, there's the Robert the Necromancer scene, which I love. So he's looking at Leanna's statue and he says, she was more beautiful than that, the king said after a silence. His eyes lingered on Leanna's face as if he could will her back to life. And then the king touched her cheek, his fingers brushing across the rough stone as gently as if it were living flesh. So it's like in every way possible, these, these statues are being equated with living people. And so it goes on and on and on. But my favorite, uh, my favorite clue about this is John. Okay, so if the kings of winter rise, they're going to be the walking dead in some fashion, right? Like, we don't know if they'll just be skeletons or if they'll have bodies or maybe they'll turn into others that are good. They'll have ice bodies. Like, any of those things could happen. We don't know. But the point is, they'll be the walking dead. And what's John about to become? He's about to become the walking dead. This is something that the show doesn't really do full justice to. But in the books, he's going to be like a better version of Barrick or Cold Hands, essentially. He's going to be some sort of walking zombie. And so here's this great scene where Arya is um, beneath King's Landing and she's running around in the dark. And so she, it says, fear cuts deeper than swords, the quiet voice inside her whispered. Suddenly Arya remembered the crypts at Winterfell. They were a lot scarier than this place, she told herself. She'd been just a little girl the first time she saw them. Her brother Rob had taken them down, her and Sansa and baby Bran, who'd been no bigger than Rickon was now. They'd only had one candle between them, and Bran's eyes had gone as big as saucers as he stared at the stone faces of the Kings of Winter, with their wolves at their feet and their iron swords across their laps. Rob took them all the way down to the end, past Grandfather and Bran and, and Lyanna, to show them their own tombs. Sansa kept looking at the stubby little candle, anxious that it might go out. Old Nan had told her that there were spiders down here and rats as big as dogs. Rob smiled when, he, when she said that. There are worse things than spiders and rats, he whispered. This is where the dead walk. That was when they heard the sound, low and deep and shivery. Baby Bran had clutched at Arya's hand. When the spirit stepped out of the open tomb, pale white and moaning for blood, Sansa ran shrieking for the stairs, and Bran wrapped himself around Rob's leg, sobbing. Arya stood her ground and gave the spirit a punch. It was only John, covered with flour. You stupid, she told him. You scared the baby. But John and Rob just laughed and laughed, and pretty soon Bran and Arya were laughing too. And so <clears throat> he, then it goes on. It says, the, the memory made Arya smile, and after that the darkness held no more terrors for her. The stable boy was dead. She'd killed him. And if he jumped out at her, she'd kill him again. <laughs> so it's already implying Arya as now somebody that can kill whites, right after talking about John as waking from the dead. And okay, so check this out. She gave the spirit a punch, right? So she punches John in the belly. But how is John murdered? Then Bowen Marsh stood there before him, tears running down his cheeks. For the watch, he punched John in the belly. When he pulled his hand away, the dagger stayed where he had buried it. So there's actually a foreshadowing of John's death in this scene that's also foreshadowing John rising from the dead. Pretty cool, right? I mean, absolutely. There, there is so much there. Um, uh, I'm just going to pick out a couple of little points there that I, I personally found interesting. But guys, in the, in the chat, if you want to sort of pick out anything that you 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 liked a lot, is um, uh, the first of all is the idea of spirits. Now, I think this for me is really important because uh, when when we're talking about the sort of the undead in Game of Thrones, we often think about ice whites or fire whites it is reanimated corpses effectively in some way uh, but this i think is an entirely different thing because it's been very made very clear that these people have been lying there not just for centuries but for millennia and we see uh, figuratively with the stone with the the uh, the, the swords which are, are across the laps they they have uh, have broken down they they uh they are no longer there so it's actually the bodies are not there anymore to be reanimated so i think we are going to see spirits we're going to see a spirit army coming forward and i think that the uh the reason how they've been held in there is is uh is but beneath the weirwood tree they could have been taken up into the weirwood tree but i think they've been protected there by the magic of the crypts and by the the swords with the sign of your uh, you were denied guest right so those for me are the the sort of the key things there do you think 
uh, LML, do you think that um, there is foreshadowing here for physical stocks returning, or are we talking spiritual stocks returning? Okay, guys, I can't I can't hear LML right now. I don't know whether you can. Uh, can you just shout in the um, in the box if if you can hear me? It's just my. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah, that's much better. Okay. Go ahead. Cool. Great. All right. So, um, uh, I I do think that the spirits is more likely, but there is a possibility that could be bodies because what if there are uh, weirwood roots running through all the tombs? Um, when 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 uh, Bran is in Bloodraven's cave, he goes down the hall from Bloodraven and he sees these old children of the forest green seers enthroned, and they look like they're kind of far gone, like their eyes are just sort of following the torch a little bit, and their mouths are moving, but they're not speaking. They're basically almost dead, but not quite dead. They're like the greens because Bloodraven's called the last green seer, so he's got to be the last like active, conscious, still alive green seer. But we also see these children of the forest green seers who are on these thrones and they're not quite dead. So these are they're basically dead. They've been subsumed into the weirwood net entirely, but their corpses are being kept alive by the roots. And they could be hundreds and thousands of years old because these are green seers that lived probably before Blood Raven. I mean, so so we 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 have a mechanism for preserving bodies. It, so it's unlikely, but it could be that in those in those uh sepulchers you know because people don't understand the crypts they're not like they're they're actual the rooms there's like sepulcher rooms behind the gravestones so in there is probably like some sort of stone plinth where the body is laid on uh what if in the older ones you know there's weirwood roots keeping the corpses alive uh that was our sort of tinfoil speculation about I mean, that i mean i i like that i have to say i mean the far-fetched but well i I don't think it is far fetched. I think that there, there is a there, there's a lot of uh, language and uh, uh, imagery that's similar between uh, the the Three Eyed Raven, Three Eyed Crow's Cave, and yes. the Winterfell Crypts. They're both underneath a huge weirwood tree. There's both lots of dead people uh, down there for both of them. Um, uh, there's there's a, there's a lot of talk about the temperature and the darkness. That's it's, it's almost as if the, you're trying to George R. R. Martin is trying to show us that these two things are deliberately set up the same. Um, the the thing that always strikes me by its absence when we're talking about the crypts is the roots. I think it is uh, is astonishing. Also, the hot springs is another thing. But it's 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 really clear that when you go down there, you would expect at some point, given that we always hear about weirwood roots breaking through stone. Um, I was mm. looking at the night fort just to, just for one of my travelers guides for the that's mm -hmm. coming out tomorrow and in that there's a weirwood that has come up through the stone uh of of the floor in the kitchens there and it's almost uh, the one at the one at the wolf's den is is said to be like crashing through the walls even uh, like it's like absolutely this, yeah and so so we would expect that uh in the normal course of events given the fact that the crypts are directly underneath the weirwood, the weirwood's roots would have come through into it, but they haven't for some reason. There is something going on there that is preventing them, whether that's that could magic, be. magic around it, or yeah. the weirwood is clever enough that it is not showing itself, so nobody thinks about it. But it's it's very clear absence of it. It could be a, just a reveal that Martin doesn't want to give us yet. Like, it, you know, when we go down the lower levels, we'll find big weirwood roots, you know, breaking breaking the ceiling and stuff. And it could be that the roots are only in the actual rooms where the dead bodies are. Um, but I suspect it would be a narrative thing where he just doesn't want to show us that yet. And so we haven't seen them yet. Um, but you're right. It is it is worth thinking about the fact that we don't see them. Uh, it's It's either they're specifically not there because they're warded, like you're saying, or it's it's a reveal that Martin's and Martin's holding off. But if I could go back to what I was saying earlier, the whole point of uh, raising the issue of John <clears throat> as as a zombie, a Stark zombie that's going to be fighting the others, is that the most vivid depiction of a King of Winter rising from the crypts was John walking out of the tomb covered in flour. So it invites us to compare the Kings of Winter rising to zombified John. You follow me? Mm -hmm. 
so because that's what they're showing us they're showing us uh, a, a, a the stark dead rising from the tombs that's exactly what john is going to do he's going to be a stark dead that's that's now going to be a walking dead and so it could be that the original starks uh there was an original posse that became undead in order to fight the the others and this is my green zombies theory essentially is that cold hands is showing us the example of what it takes to be able to face the cold dead lands cold hands doesn't need to eat he doesn't need to sleep he doesn't need to stay warm and those are the exact sort of skills uh, skills that you'd want to face the others he's he's perfect to wander the cold dead lands and john is very likely going to be similar whether he's a ice white or a fire white it's true either way he doesn't need to eat or drink he doesn't need to sleep and he doesn't need to stay warm and so when they talk about the last hero's 12 companions dying i think that they died and were resurrected into zombies and these these this could have been the original stark army that you're talking about that rose from the crypts uh, or that, you know, the first, like I said, the first set of undead that face the others. I think there's a lot to that idea. Yeah, I mean, I think I I, I could certainly buy into that. I, I haven't looked into that as, as a possibility, but I, I think the, so the first one, if we just take the 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 narrative at its word, the, the, the Knight's King was the 13th Lord Commander, so they, there would have been some Starks buried uh, there to come back, but not not the hundreds that we probably have at the moment. Uh, we've had a few um, uh, super chats that we, I, I just want to quickly come to. Uh, Thanks, Tycat, everybody. Um, uh, $4.99, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I, I know you've been trying to come on live stream, but uh, missing it the last few times, great to see you. I love the idea that the crypts are as alive and growing as the roots of the weirwoods. Um, I think this is a really important point, actually. I think um, somebody said it, earlier in the chat, I didn't pick up on it then, uh, but when Winterfell is described, again, look back at the early chapters, particularly the brand chapters uh, of, of Game of Thrones, uh, it's described like a human body with the, the hot spr water from the hot springs being pumped around it. Um, and there is, uh, if you look at the inside of the inner curtain wall, the tunnel that goes around it seems very much like the inside of a root or something like that, that Bran yeah. scurries through. So there's- I liked, the, I liked that analogy that you drew, by the way, it was good. That, thank you. I mean, I think I think that there's a, there's a very clear literary image being given of Winterfell, not just being something built by humans out of stone, but something that has been built with and through and uh, uh, being part of the Weirwood. And I think that applies above ground as much as it does below ground, but it started below ground. So, so hey, Robert, when I was listening to your, I was just uh, rewatching and binging on some of your videos earlier today. And I was watching that one in particular. And so when you were talking about uh, the Stark dead and the crypts, you know, rising. One of the best clues about that is the fact that Winterfell is described as a labyrinth and a monstrous stone tree. Now you pulled the, they're in the same paragraph. You pulled the end of the paragraph about the stone tree, but the beginning of that paragraph describes Winterfell as a labyrinth. And of course, what does a labyrinth have inside? It has a minotaur, which is a monster. And so when you call Winterfell Labyrinth, you're implying that there's a monster ready to wake in there. And then, what, well, what's a stone tree? That's a weirwood because weirwoods turn into stone. And like you said, the entire Winterfell itself is depicted as this like living castle. It's all centered around the weirwoods. And so basically when you're saying like Winterfell is a, itself is a stone tree, you're saying like there's, well, what lives inside of stone trees? Green seers, like people live inside them. So both of those descriptions imply that there's something inside Winterfell living that's like a monster that's like trapped. So yeah, that complements it pretty well. I mean, I think so. I, I, I mean, uh, there, there is so much more, I think, that we can say about uh, about Winterfell as a as a place. And I think uh, the my idea that I picked up on or started to talk about in that video, but uh, perhaps I'll do in more detail in another one, is that it was built intentionally to be this kind of fallback plan if the wall falls we have got this army yes. that we can we can bring forth uh, so that is my idea of what it is and that is why it is built around the weirwood um just want to quickly go across to another a couple of super chats we've had thank you guys this is amazing uh, emilio uh, camacho Ariche, you are both awesome do you guys think the wildlings were the original members of the night's watch and supporters of the night's king being exiled 
Uh, I'll throw that one over to you, LML. Oh gosh, that's an interesting idea. It, I, it is. I've not had a good theory about the wildlings um, and why they're separated. That's, I, you know, what's interesting is that um, we're told that, uh, you know, Jorman united with Brandon the Breaker Stark to throw down Night's King, which implies that like the wildlings are already a developed culture, you know, all, at the very beginning, and that there's some sort of like uh, there was a day when they would team up with the Starks even. So that's, it just, I don't know. There's definitely a link there. Some people even think that like Jorman was like the bastard brother of Brandon, the breaker Stark and that they it was some sort of familial schism that the wildlings represent. And that's kind of similar to what they were just saying. Like they were the night's watch that got exiled with the uh, night's King. I hadn't thought about that, but that's sort of a similar theme. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a nice idea. I mean, uh, I don't know is the honest answer, uh, but I think that when we look back uh, thousands of years, we need to stop thinking of the wildlings and people south of the wall as being two completely separate peoples. They were all first men. It's just the where they happened to be when the wall appeared. Um, uh, so I, I hope that's given you a, a bit of a of an answer uh, on that one uh, Emilio uh, Michelle M Palais says uh, cheers and thank you guys for your time and dedication you are very welcome uh, I'm really enjoying this and I'm sure LML is as well uh, quickly scrolling down cross country with the burgies says just uh, $30 wow thank you that's great uh, just tuned in uh, sorry late no question just want to show some love love your videos just gonna catch up here well, thank you. You're welcome. This is uh, uh, you. You have missed a little bit, but uh, you can always catch up. It'll be uh, as a video uh, on my channel um, uh, soon after we've uh, finished here. And, and then Kelly uh, Lausman says, "Are the weirwoods in the Isle of Faces connected to the rest of the net?" Uh, mm. God oh, sorry. they're the hub of the net. If anything, uh, yes, I would agree. Um, um, I think the so my thinking is that there are some things that prevent the net um, uh, from uh, sort of uh, reaching new areas. So I watched your video about that this morning. That was really good. Uh, thank you. So I mean, the, for the people who haven't, uh, I think that, so for example, the, the reason why the weirwood couldn't grow in the Erie, um, even though they brought out huge, huge amounts of soil for it, I think was because the Erie is so very high and there's just so much solid rock that even a weirwood couldn't get through it. I think mm -hmm. this uh, perhaps also partly explains about Casterly Rock. It's, it is a rock. They have got a weirwood, but it's, it's a bit sort of uh half grown so to speak half dead half alive. well so the casterly rock weirwood is in a grotto um it, it basically at the base of the rock so it's it probably has a connection straight to the ground i would think uh, well I, i'll bow to your superior knowledge on that one that's that's good knowledge uh but the, on the iron islands i think this is why there are none there because that they're across uh, open sea similarly essos we obviously haven't seen all of essos but uh, but we haven't yeah, no, got nothing on dragonstone yeah so so i think that that there are things which can stop it personally i think uh, as lml said i think that the isle of faces is the hub the center of of the network as it were so i think that is yes i think that they have got roots that go underneath that even if it is quite deep uh so hey uh, there's another question in the chat that i'd actually like to address of course so somebody brought up the famous scene of the dragon that appears to hatch at the end of a clash of kings when bran is warging summer and he sees uh, a fiery serpent uh you know a, a flying snake whose roar was a river of flame in and, and, and right in Winterfell, and this is when they're hiding in the crypts, and they're using the wolves. Brand's using the wolves to sort of see if it's safe to come out yet, and they're watching. They're seeing some of the fire and the burning of the of the. Uh, so yeah, so there's the the dragon hatches, and then when they get out, uh, Osha says, "Oh, we made enough noise to wake a dragon." <laughs> so it's like, well, holy shit, what are we talking about here? It's really hard to make a real theory out of this. Like, was there an actual dragon that hatched there? Like, it's. It's tough, like you want to believe it, but it just sounds like tinfoil. But I think that, that probably that's just symbolism and it's talking about John, like all of the clues about dragon eggs below Winterfell. And this is what uh, Kimberly was saying in the chat, like there's enough dragons. Like, yeah, I, I totally think that all that stuff about dragon eggs and a dragon heating the hot springs and the dragon that hatched out of the castle, this is George's way of telling us that John is a dragon that's beneath Winterfell the king under the snow who's like waiting to hatch. I think that's absolutely the kind of symbolic 
foreshadowing, if you will, that I, that I like to talk about. Uh, and and I would agree with you completely on that one. I think uh, I know a lot of people say is the dragon underneath Winterfell. The 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 imagery that we got there, seen through the eyes of Summer, was not. Uh, there's an actual huge lizard flying through the air. We didn't get any other reports of anyone else seeing it, uh, and you would have thought that they probably would. So I think yes, I think this was symbolic of showing what comes from uh, from Winterfell. Um, uh, there is a question connected to that. I was wanting to to, to ask you uh, in just a second. I just want to pick up on LMC uh, uh, nineteen dollars ninety nine. Thank you. No question. Just a big thanks for the excellent info, banter, and discussion. Always a pleasure. And then L Shell uh, nine dollars ninety nine. Uh, no question. But thank you again. That's amazing. Um, can I uh, pick up on? We've mentioned it uh, a couple of times when we're thinking about the dead of Winterfell, and um, in when I've been talking about it as being sort of thematically similar to uh, Aragorn leading the Dead Men of Dunharrow, uh, and yeah. in the the sort of the equivalent in in A Song of Ice and Fire is Jon Snow. I don't think they've got the same story, and I think that they are very different characters. And I think George R. R. Martin is playing on that, so we we think of him in the same way, but actually they're going to end up different. But uh, the implication, as you said there, with him being this dead man leading the army of the Stark dead, sounds right. But at the same time, when we get John's visions, his dreams of going into the crypts, he hears the, or imagines he hears the, the dead Starks saying to him, this is not your place, you do not belong here. So what do you think that they would follow him? And if so, why? So I think that <clears throat> there's a little bit of a conflict going on. It's like John, John thinks, oh, this is not my place. They don't want me here, but I know I have to go further. And then he later says, it's not the Stone Kings I'm afraid of. So I think the idea that um, when they say it's not your place, that was at the very, that was in a Game of Thrones, if I recall correctly. And at that point in the story, a large part of John's identity is around him not belonging with the Starks. It's the first thing that Martin wants to establish. And so in these earlier phases of this reoccurring dream, it's, uh, you know, he doesn't feel welcome. But as the dream goes on, he goes further and further, and he's, you know, not really afraid of the Kings of Winter. So I think that what he's actually terrified is, is this secret of his identity that's going to be revealed. So I would very much expect, you know, John, when he's dead inside Ghost, to have a, a dream experience and and get to the end of the crypts, maybe see Leanna's ghost or the fucking who knows, Edric, King Edric Snowbeard's ghost. I mean, who knows? Like he's whatever he's supposed to find at the end of the crypts, he's going to complete that dream while he lies dead. I would think, and he's going to come back with that knowledge. It's going to change what what he does and what he has to do. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree. I think that that's that's. Uh, uh, I think John will end up going down into the crypts. I think that there probably is some knowledge that he will get there about his true parentage, um, uh, and I think that's part of what he is being drawn down to. And the, the early messages there were hints that he's not who he thinks he is, uh, uh, and therefore he doesn't. Uh, to say he doesn't belong there is probably uh, the the wrong way of looking at it in terms of he has got the Stark heritage as well as the, the Targaryen heritage. Um, okay, there's one more uh, aspect to this that I was wanting to sort of uh, pick your brains on in terms of where there might be foreshadowing. Um, uh, and guys, if you've got any other sort of questions, uh, then do just sort of fire them at us. But... Um, uh, if we've got this idea of the dead rising, uh, whether they're spirits, whether they're corporeal in some way, um, uh, we don't know. But if we get to this idea of this the, the dead rising and coming to presumably fight or confront the others, is there any foreshadowing that you know of, either in the myths or somewhere else, that talks of this kind of battle of the dead against the dead because that's a very different thing to what we've seen so far in, on, on uh, Song of Ice and Fire. 
Um, so, okay, can you rephrase that? You're you're looking for you're asking me about foreshadowing for basically what the dead fighting the dead. Um, yeah. So so I think there's lots of foreshadowing. Uh, we're agreed on this. I'm I, I'm pretty sure, and I think most of other people in the chat are agreed. There is there's lots of foreshadowing about the fact that the Stark dead will rise. They will they will come out. Uh, uh, I'm pretty convinced that the Horn of Winter is the trigger for that. I think that the intention there is for them to fight or confront some great evil that, that is facing humanity. But is there any foreshadowing of what happens next? What 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 happens when the dead rise and they're facing an army of the dead? Well, they got to fight. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the the big clue is really cold hands. Uh, he's like one of the most important clues because what is he? He's a walking zombie night's watchman who's sort of patrolling the north and fighting against the whites and helping out the green seers and the living. And we're told that the children of the forest helped organize the first night's watch. So we know that the night's watch and the children are supposed to play on the same team. So the fact that cold hands is this undead ranger and like I said, Martin is showing us he has the ideal skill set. He doesn't have to eat or sleep. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't like he can he might be 8000 years old for all we know. <laughs> and he's he's fine. So John is obviously the one who's going to fight the others. And he's being turned into a zombie, too. So that tells you, like, this is a thing. And then you see the last hero. Well, his 12 companions died. That's interesting. What happened next? You know, <laughs> like maybe they came back to life. And you would have had a crew of zombies. So here's here's another one for you. Okay, so Barak. Barak is a great symbol. He's one of my favorite symbols. He's got a flaming sword, so he makes us think of Azor High. And he's running on fire magic. He's been raised from the dead by fire magic, so that's good. He's a warrior of fire. But he's also got one eye, like Blood Raven. And when we first see him, he's sitting in a weirwood throne, essentially. It's not called that, but it's a nest of weirwood roots that he's sitting in. So he looks just like Blood Raven, just like a green steer, but he's also a Zora High. So what does that tell you? Like you're it starts to make you think of a Zora High as being maybe a green seer or an undead person. Now the matching thing to this is John's dream of manning the wall when he's armored in black ice and his sword burns red in his fist and he's atop the wall and he's slaying the, the wildlings. He actually kills Yagrit and he kills his brother Rob and he kills people he knows. And then the wildlings are scuttling up the ice like spiders. And he's sending the dead down to die again, which now it sounds like he's fighting the others. But you know what else is going on in that scene? Is he's in his dream, he's thinking about the scarecrow brothers that they made earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, when they were fighting the wildlings. Do you remember the scarecrow brothers? Uh, remind me. So they didn't have very many people to defend Castle Black when the wildlings were coming. And so what they did is they took extra Night's Watch robes and they made scarecrows and they put them in the windows and they put them on the wall. And then they had, they hid the real brothers in between them with, with archery and, and with bows and arrows. And so they, they called them the scarecrow, the scarecrow brothers. They referred to him a bunch of times. So in John's dream, the only people that are with him are scarecrow brothers. There's no other Night's Watchmen, but the scarecrow brothers are up there on the wall and they catch fire. They catch fire and then they tumble down. So here's the thing, Barrack is called the Scarecrow Knight and he wears a black cloak and he has a burning sword, just like John in that dream. So now we've got this idea that the Scarecrow Knight's Watch Brothers who are on fire parallel Barrack, the Scarecrow Knight, who's undead and on fire and who's got a flaming sword that would work really well at the wall. And so I think what George is showing us is that the original Night's Watch that fought with the last hero, who's who John is in that scene, were Scarecrow Brothers. They were Fire Whites. That's what I think. I, I think you follow a, that. I, I I did, and I think that's a really good theory. Um, uh, I mean, so we're, we're think about it as like an archetypal vision of the War for the Dawn. You've got John Snow, and he's armored in ice, which sounds like maybe he's a zombie too. And he's got a burning red sword. And then the only people fighting with him are burning scarecrow Night's Watchmen. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a few things I would pick out from that. I think the armored in ice with the fiery sword, uh, 
there's a clear link there to the symbolism that, that the Song of Ice and Fire, one, one of the many uh, ways of interpreting the Song of Ice and Fire is that this is about John being the, 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 the middle piece between ice uh, being Starks and the sort of the the, the wogging the old uh, religion, yep. old magic, uh, and fire, the Targaryens and dragons and fire magic, and he being the combination of the two. So I think there's there's certainly that. Um, the reason why I was sort of pausing and thinking was that um, uh, one of the the videos that I I have watched recently uh was uh something that alt shift x put out actually just uh just a couple of days ago about mm -hmm. blood raven uh which uh and as as i'm sure you guys know i'm always very happy to point people towards videos and things that i find interesting that i think you might find interesting check it out uh uh I found it quite annoying because I was about to do a Blood Raven video and, and he said an awful lot of things I was going to say. So I thought, you know uh, what, I'll, I'll, I'll let him do that one. I'll just do what History of Westeros did a Blood Raven episode too. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will leave that one be. Uh, but, but he came out with some really interesting thoughts uh, about how Blood Raven has been influencing what's been going on in the story so far. And one of them was by putting, he's, he thought that he put that vision into John's mind because he wants John to to think of himself as Azora High reborn, because sure. he sees him as being uh, the the hope for humanity, uh, and as a result, that was a planted dream rather than uh, anything that actually is part of John John magically knowing sure. something about himself. That could be. Yep. Okay, I mean, guys. It just doesn't it just doesn't change the the symbolism that's being implied there essentially, like. I totally agree. It could be a Blood Raven, but that actually makes it even better because what's Blood Raven trying to show him? He's trying to show him how he's going to be the new last hero and fight against, you know, defend the wall against the forces of ice that scuttle up like spiders. So, and by the way, I don't know if you've ever thought about the idea of ice spiders climbing the wall, but that's pretty freaking terrifying if that happens, right? Uh, yeah, there is there's so much uh, in terms of visuals that they could do in season eight uh, uh, that I just it blows my mind. I mean, I have to admit the the one thing that I am um, uh, I'm quite sad about is the fact that for all of our talk of the Horn of Winter and the the Stark Dead Rising, these are things that are massive in the books. But in the yeah. show, they've not really picked up on it. The Horn of Winter was like an Easter egg. They just showed it was there. They've not yeah. made it since. Uh, when they've gone down to the crypts, it's always been about Lyanna. They've not been thinking yep. about the other stock dead. So uh, I personally... It is what it is, man. It is what it is. We can't gnash our teeth about it. You know, the well, show, I'm, they only use like 5% of the magic and stuff from the books. So. Exactly. But as I, what I'm trying to say is I don't think this is going to happen mm. in the show. Uh, mm. I think Ice Spiders probably will simply because it looks cool. Uh, but I think <laughs> that, that whole extra layer that we've we've been talking about probably won't be a show thing. Um, uh, I want to... Let me... The whole, on. Before we move, I got one last thing to uh, about the barrack and the scarecrow. I, I I missed the biggest piece. Okay, so I don't know if you know how much uh, how much like Wicker Man uh, folklore. You know, there was there was a movie called Wicker Man, but essentially, um, the there's the European folklore around the Wicker Man is tied to the Green Man uh, mythology. And what a Wicker Man is is uh, like a farmer in the fall. He's going to take some of the dead stalks and shoots from his harvest that he didn't use and he makes a little man out of it. It's a little straw man. And then in the spring, you set it on fire and you burn it. So the idea of burning straw men, uh, such as you know the scarecrow knight, because the scarecrows are literally stuffed with straw, the scarecrow brothers on the, on the wall. And so that's the whole idea is like this burning scarecrow, that's just an image of the wicker man. And, but here's the thing, uh, the wicker man is also called the king of winter. No shit. The, the, like in real in real world folklore, yeah. if you look up King of Winter, Wicker Man, you'll read all this stuff about this tradition of burning your Wicker Man. Who's he's the King of Winter because he rules over winter, and then in the spring you sort of sacrifice him and you burn him. So the idea of the King of Winter, which is who John embodies as a burning scarecrow, is something that's already in world folklore. So then John uh, George shows us this vision of John fighting with a bunch of burning scarecrows and he's the king of winter. So it's, you know, it's, it sounds like far fetched at first when I start connecting like the scarecrows on the wall to Barrack or whatever, but George walks us through it step by step 
with the symbolic language and the references to real world mythology. And he puts very clear flags in there. To I mean, he, the Starks are called the King of Winter. And just one day I typed in, hmm, King of Winter, what's that? Oh, look, it's a wicker man. That's interesting. <laughs> you know, it, it it is. I mean, I th I think uh, everything that that George R. R. Martin does uh, is intentional. He means to do it. I th I think that the, the oh, yeah. we often lots of people give him uh, some grief for the time he takes writing each book. Uh, but when you think about it, five, six, seven years, whatever it is between books, uh, actually is needed in order to make all of these layers work um uh, and it was the he started off thinking it was a trilogy and he sort of built out from it so that uh everything that is happening now has got layers and layers of symbolism to it uh and it's on on one level we've got this history rhyming uh which i think a lot of people do but you, we certainly get that we certainly see that uh in things like the mad king and then the sort of the what cersei's have been doing in the show and burning sure. down the, the uh the tower of the hand and things like that um uh, but then we also get the as, as we've been covering here the the myths that are being brought forward again and sort of echoed again but i think for me the 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 brilliance of it is that it's not just that what the 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 importance that I think George keeps on trying to show us is it's not actually whether something is true, whether that something necessarily has to happen is fate, is a prophecy, whatever. It's whether or not people believe it to be true. So the idea of Azora High, the importance to the plot of Azora High and Azora High Reborn is actually not so much questioning is there an individual who is going to be Azora High Reborn. It's the fact that people like Melisandre believe it absolutely passionately, and that drives the action. The fact that she believes that Stannis is Azora High Reborn changes so much of what happens, regardless of the fact that it's clearly not right. The fact that she believes it is what's important. Um, I want to wrap up quite soon, but I just want to go and have a look back, see if there's any other uh, comments in the in the chat. So, guys, if you've got any more any, any more comments you want to just flag for us uh, in the last few minutes, that's great. There was one I did just see flicking back a little way uh, that I wanted to pick up on. Uh, Michelle M. Palais says, uh, maybe the Horn of Winter is in the caved area and Ghost finds it. This actually picks up on something that I didn't talk about in my video, but the idea of the horn being broken does this mean the horn was broken in two? Does this mean that the reason why it doesn't work is we need to find the other piece, and mm. perhaps that's something that's <laughs> hidden back exactly? Something that's hidden. In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 an odd thing that a horn being called broken is a bit weird, particularly when there's no obvious breaks in it. So, uh, so I really liked that point that you made. I thought that was really cool. It, it is actually chipped a little bit, but that doesn't really make it broken. I kind of agree with you. Like he's sort of implying something deeper with that word. I totally like that. I never thought of it, but it's a good observation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I mean, I think that there's the um, uh, broken. Uh, they didn't think it was broken. They they tried to blow it. It didn't look broken. And so I do wonder whether, uh, and this is tinfoil, I've got absolutely nothing to back this up with, but I do wonder whether the other half is perhaps uh, in Winterfell Crypts behind that rubble, behind uh, in the bit that we can't get to. It would make sense to me that uh, it was decided that half of it should be in Winterfell and half of it should be the other side of the wall, which is where we found it, uh, so that when the threat to all of humanity happens, then we have to, as happened with the Night's King in the legend, the wildlings and the people south of the wall have to come together in order to create, create the solution. So that makes a lot of sense to me. So I think that um, we can learn a lot uh, about the by looking at Dragonbinder, which is intended as a parallel of the Horn of Winter. And you have to clean Dragonbinder with blood. I suspect the way that you fix the horn, if, if it literally is a thing that needs to be fixed, is by claiming it with blood. It needs some blood. Yeah, I think you might be right. And I think that the um, 
every bit of magic and this is a, a video i'm working my way up to for those who've been following my sort of uh, series on uh, the gods of Win of, of of westeros uh is is what the nature of magic in the world is uh, and there are some themes that run through every bit of magic we've got one of these is sacrifice you can't just do magic just just like that, it has to cost you something in some way. So yes, in order to make a magical horn work, you have to pay a price. And maybe that's a blood price. Maybe that's a price that Bran the Builder paid ages ago saying, you know what, all of my ancestors are gonna have to stay here forever, not get any peace, just waiting. Maybe that's the price that was paid. Uh, not sure on that. Shall we just have a, have a last quick go through, see, uh, see who's there in the chat? Yeah, um, I've got I've got two things that I've been saving uh, that I want to give you to close with, uh, but comments on what you said. And uh, so the first thing is, and then, yeah, I guess we can scan the chat and see if there's any last questions to throw up. So first thing, you talk about waking giants from the earth. The weirwoods are called pale giants frozen in time. And so if the Stark dead, if their spirits are inside the weirwood, then the weirwoods waking could just mean letting their spirits back out. Okay, that makes a so, lot of sense. Yeah. There's that. And also Winterfell itself is described as a stone tree. So you can sort of extrapolate that, you know. Um, the other thing is what you were just saying about all the plot echoes and the parallels and stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, I know probably I'd say a third of the people in the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom are aspiring writers on some level. Would you agree? Like a yeah, lot of us are lot, writers. Yeah. Okay. So here, here's the thing. If you want to write a story with 40 POV characters, that takes place over seven books on four continents, you need things to tie things together. You need to give a lot of characters common themes, common ideas, common plot arcs, so that the story has resonance. Otherwise, it's just gonna be like this pile of shit going in 40 different directions. It doesn't make any sense at all. So by doing all of these plot resonances and fractal echoings and refractions, Danny and, and Bran being parallel characters, this gives the story cohes cohesion and it gives it resonance. And it's really, it's, it couldn't work without that, I'm, in my opinion. No, I, I agree. And there's, a, um, uh, there's also an element to this uh, with the sort of the, the writing idea of Chekhov's gun, uh, where, and for those who aren't aware of this, it's uh, uh, Chekhov, the, the writer, talked about if you in in act one of a play you call attention to a gun hanging on the wall by the end of the play somebody has to have used it uh it's part of it what's it's what makes stories work you can't just draw huge amounts of attention to something and then just not mention it again right that's why uh, we call it Chekhov's wall because it's called <laughs> the end of the world like four times in the first two books yeah, exactly. So it's it's the and and so when you're reading, uh, particularly the first book, I know I come back to it a lot, saying that because there's so much symbolism in the first book. Uh, mm -hmm. Look for the things that attention is drawn to, uh, because those are the things that are going to be important at, in the end game. Uh, because the the wall is clearly very important, and the the crypts come up again and again and again, and there is no way that they're unimportant. There's no way they're just like, a, oh, this is interesting. Did you know the Starks bury their dead uh, beneath Winterfell? They, they did. Oh, by the way, up. they look like they're about to get up in every scene that you see them in. <laughs> exactly. So I th I think in in terms of literary style, it has to it has to happen. Uh, is is my view. Let's just uh, do a few uh, last quick uh, hellos to some people in chat, and then I want to I, I want to wrap it up there because I don't. I, I, allergic to, to you said it was going to be an on. hour i told you it was I gonna did be i did i'm sorry and so the problem was the conversation was too good uh, uh oh. so uh, <laughs> and, and, and actually just before we say hello to a few people i just want to say um i don't think we covered all of this and and i think that we could definitely come back and do this again so uh, so guys if you if you like that idea let us know but i'd uh, i'd love to have you on again at some point just to for sure, man, for sure. Keep, keep on working our way through this uh but just uh, just a few hellos there uh eduardo blanco i can see jeremy kelton uh Mary Benitez, true to you. Uh, someone called Lucifer means Lightbringer is chatting on there. Um, Scott McCloy, the Night King, Al Shell, lots of lots of really good people. Um, uh, thank you all so uh, so much. This is a, we've had a uh, a lot of really good questions coming through from there. Um, 
LML, do you want to just sort of uh, finish up from your side? If there's any last points you want to make, but also uh, let people know, uh, remind people where they can find you on the internet if they've if they've been struck by some of the things you've been saying. I've just made it so easy, guys. Just type in Lucifer Lightbringer and you'll find my page. My page is called Lucifer Means Lightbringer. My YouTube channel is called Lucifer Means Lightbringer. Um, the podcast, if you're looking for it in your podcast feed, is called The Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire. So that's the one thing that's different. But yeah, please come on and check it out. It's really exciting once you catch the bug for symbolism. Uh, it's kind of like a fire that burns through your mind and uh, it's pretty gripping. And uh, if you're on Twitter, definitely hit me up on Twitter. We've been doing a lot of running a Song of Ice and Fire analysis, me and my crew of friends and so other content creators and writers and stuff. Uh, so I'm at the Dragon LML on Twitter. And uh, Robert, I would just say I would love to collaborate again. And, you know, we should do more of this next time where we start with one of your theories that you've made a video about. And then I can sort of like throw you some symbolic evidence and, you know, wordplay sort of clues to sort of bolster your theory and maybe even take it a little farther. I, I think that would probably work pretty well. I, I agree. I th I'd, I'd love to do that. So uh, so so let's let's have a chat after this and we'll we'll uh, we'll see where we might be able to cool. go with that. Uh, okay, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up there. Thank you again to uh, to everyone, uh, particularly people who did the super chats. Um, I scribbled some. I probably missed out a few names here: LMC, uh, Michelle, Tycat, Crips, Karen Richmond, uh, uh, Lana Allen, Emilio, K Jackson, True to You, Sarixian, uh, uh, Jags Two Thousand. Uh, thank you all. That's that's incredibly generous. Um, uh, and uh, thank you to the everyone in the chat. It, it's been uh, it's been really good. This is uh, this has been for me a real eye, eye opener, and I know that a lot of people have been saying they're going to be coming checking out your channel. So, guys, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, LML, uh, and I will see all of you again soon. Take care. Cheers.